Thank you, Aaron. Um, so uh, building on Aaron's discussion, um, I had always heard about assessment and the importance, uh, the importance of assessment. But like probably many of you, I never really understood why assessment was important until I was involved in an effort to transform a course that I had been teaching, uh, a large introductory physics course. So since, um, since about 2007, I had taught two large introductory physics courses every year. These are actually the largest courses offered by the physics department. There are about 200 students each, mostly life science and pre-medical students who are compelled to take physics as part of their pre-med requirements. It's not an easy population of students to teach. Um, and physics had devoted tremendous resources to try and improve these courses, to make them more engaging, more interactive. We hired postdoctoral fellows to come and help us create materials for the courses. We added lots of biological and medical examples. And we did everything we could to make these courses really more successful. And it worked. I mean, the courses really were improved between that time, 2007, when we launched them, and you know, the past couple of years. But the pedagogy in these courses were still traditional lectures. Um, and then just over a year ago, my colleague, Louis Delorier, came to our department. Louis is an expert in science education. And he convinced me that we should also try to change the pedagogy of the course and try to change the course to a pedagogy involving active learning in the classroom. And he insisted that assessment would be essential in this transformation, but I didn't understand why. I just said, oh, yeah, sure, assessment. I've heard about assessment. Um, OK, I'll, I'll accept that you're the expert, and I'll go along with it. Um, but I realized as we went on that assessment really played a role in every aspect of this course transformation. And over the course of this, not only was our teaching transformed, but I was transformed in my own uh, perception of what assessment means and how it can play a role. So just a quick overview of what, there we go, just a quick overview of what we were doing. So we have this large introductory physics course. Um, in 2013-2014, we taught this using traditional lecture. The following year, after Louis came to Harvard, um, we tried to redo the course using active learning. And uh, we kept everything essentially the same, except for what we were doing in the classroom. Same student population, the same syllabus, same homework. Uh, we even kept all the content and coverage, lecture by lecture. We covered the same material. So how did we know if this was going to be successful? And this was my idea of assessment. We were able to use the same final exam. So we had never released the final exam the previous year. I said, well, Louis asked about this. And I said, yes, we could give the same final exam. And in my mind, this was what it meant to do assessment, that we could give the same final exam, see if the students learned more. And that would tell us if the course transformation actually helped improve learning. Um, but and just to, just to give you a context here, what do you mean when we transform to active learning? So I think a video here is worth 1,000 pictures and 1,000 uh, and a picture is worth a thousand words. So let's just pull up a quick video. I think you all know what traditional lectures look like. But here's a video of our class. Um, so you can see in an active learning classroom, the students are sitting in groups. It's still in a lecture hall, but the students are sitting in groups. They're working on activities. They're talking with one another. They're trying to solve problems. We're trying to get them to think like a physicist in an environment where we, the experts, can come around and give them guidance and coaching and feedback. So I think you can see here that this looks very different from what our previous traditional lectures uh, had been. So I think that's, hopefully from this you get a sense of what we were doing. And this, um, and this idea of using active learning had been based on lots of research. In fact, Louis published a major paper in Science, the journal Science, um, where they showed that students really do learn more. I mean, this was a real, a real well-controlled study with assessment. And what I realized in retrospect is this act of learning in the classroom, this is assessment. Assessment is going on all the time. Students are getting feedback on how they're learning. And more importantly, we are also getting feedback. The instructors are getting feedback on how they're learning. So in this class, we really had many different kinds of assessment. And I'll point out in your, in your um, packets, you have this sheet here, which says examples of assessments, techniques, and pedagogies. And if there's, a, if there's any message we'd like to um, emphasize in, this, in the workshops today, that assessment can mean so many different things. And it's not just you know no child left behind, standardized testing, the bureaucratization of higher education or education at every level. But there is a useful bit of jargon that we can use here. So 
This first group of assessment in our class, in class activities, in class quizzes, so on, this is what is often called formative assessment. These are tools that are really just used to give feedback on student learning. So students can find out, am I learning the material? And faculty can find out if the students are learning the material. These are usually not graded or the grading is very low stakes. Um, some of these we give in class quizzes, they're called, am I getting it? So students just know, am I getting it? That's the feedback. Um, and then there are summative assessments, another bit of jargon. But here the idea is you want to evaluate student learning. And a classic example would be a final exam, but there are other examples, a final paper or final project that might be summative uh, assessments. And in this class, we also had um, midterm exams. We were able to use both a mix of formative and, and summative assessments. So let me go through an example here of creating a formative assessment. And in designing this class, we, most of our time in creating the class was actually in creating these in-class activities where students could practice thinking like a physicist. And these activities are really good examples of formative assessment. Um, and Louis insisted that in order to create a good activity, in order to create a good formative assessment, we first would need to articulate the learning goals for each lecture. And I was skeptical about this. I had heard a lot about learning goals. And I had talked to other people about learning goals. And my opinion was similar to some other faculty that I spoke with who said, oh, learning goals. Yeah, these were faculty at another school. Our provost used to make us write learning goals for our courses and post them with our syllabi. And it was a, really a terrible experience. And I hope that you don't talk about learning goals at the HILT conference. So I acknowledge that learning goals, writing learning goals is tedious. It feels awkward. It feels artificial. Um, and the value was not apparent to me until we used this to try to create assessments and try to create effective activities. So I see learning goals now as a tool. It's like many tools, it's sort of mundane. It's not very glamorous, but it actually is a very useful tool in creating good assessments. So here's an example. Um, here was an activity we were doing as an in-class activity. This was in the lecture on rotational motion. And we had activity one, question one, a question that we thought from our experience was going to be fairly simple. It certainly was you know, 10th grade trigonometry, well within the math prerequisite of the course. And we handed this to the students and had them start working on it. And th it crashed and burned. And the students were immediately stuck. They didn't know how to approach this activity or how to start on it. And we were shocked. Okay, I had been teaching this subject for six years. Students always found it a difficult topic, rotation is a difficult topic. And I had no idea that this elementary concept was something that was confusing for them. And so this was amazing. I was getting immediate feedback in class that, wow, they didn't know this. So I could stop the activity and say, OK, let's take some time and really talk about what this means. And so we could react in real time. But the import important lesson for me here is the only reason I put this very elementary skill in the activity is because when I was forced to write out the learning goals, as I was doing that, I said, well, yeah, I guess they have to be able to do 10th grade trigonometry. That's part of the goal here. And because I had written out those learning goals, I said, well, I better stick it in the assessment. And then we got this crucial feedback that in six years of teaching this subject, I had never seen before. And so that was a very powerful uh, moment for me to see the effectiveness both of an active learning classroom as well as the value of formative assessment. So there we go. Yeah, so now uh, let's move on to uh, summative assessments. So as opposed to uh, form uh, formative assessments that Logan just talked about, uh, this jargon here, summative, means we're no longer as concerned to, uh, to provide the ongoing feedback you know, to students and the teaching staff. Now it's just we want to evaluate you know, what's, what's happened, basically. So you know, when we think of summative assessment, most people, you know, what comes to mind is the final exam. And of course, we certainly use this in, in this course. In fact, for us, it had the dual purpose. So with the final exam, not only did we use it to evaluate you know, students in the usual way we do, but at the same time, we used it crucially to evaluate as the, if the transformation worked or not, because we used the same final exam that was unreleased in both years, before and after the transformation. So here's uh, some data. So there are two distributions here. Uh, the red distribution is the student scores on the final exam before the course transformation. And in white, you see the distribution moves to the right. Um, 
with the higher average, uh, that's a distribution of student scores on the same final exam after the transformation. So what's, uh, what's interesting here is that if you think about this, the only aspect of the course that we touched are the lectures. That's only three hours a week. And when we survey students and ask them, how many hours a week do you spend on homework and other aspects of the course, we get a, you know, an average of about 13, 14 hours total. So we only touch three hours out of the total contact time that they have with the material, and we get a big gain like that. So that's quite meaningful from that point of view. Now, two things I want to highlight. Um, and this is something that I'm used to now, because that was the sixth course that I've transformed in the same way. And what we see every time is that we pretty much eliminate failures. You know, those go away. There's so much feedback along the way that it seems that students that are at risk, you know, typically, you know, at least find the help that they need. Yes, yes, that's not an issue, yeah. Um, so the other aspect that's often underappreciated um, are the top performers. So it turns out the top performers seem to uh, benefit just as much from these types of active learning environments. In fact, uh, the number of students that scored above 90% on that three-hour final exam went from 5% before the transformation to 12% afterwards, so more than doubled. So, um, yeah, so again, the assessment here, the summative assessment was used for two different purposes. That was obviously very important. Um, so another completely different kind of assessment, summative assessment that we used is, and you'll find, I think some of you will find this weird. Um, I found this weird when I started learning about science education. It's uh, this assessment uh, tries to measure student attitudes about the discipline, try to measure, uh, you know, how expert-like students think about physics in our case, or how expert-like students think about learning physics. Okay, so this uh, survey takes about 10 minutes for them to fill out. It's uh, made up of 42 multiple choice questions. And the way it works is as follow. Let me give you an example. Here's one statement. I do not expect physics equations to help my understanding of the ideas. They are just for doing calculations. So if you give this statement to any expert in the field, they'll always answer it in the same way. They'll say, I strongly disagree. So if anyone answers that question that way, they get 100% for that question, as far as the survey is concerned. But if you give that question to novices, they'll typically answer it in the opposite way. They'll say, yeah, I agree. That's the way I feel about this. What's interesting is that if you tell students, um, we've done that study actually, if you tell students, okay, now I want you to answer that survey in the way you think experts are going to answer those questions, well, they all look like experts. So they know what the right answers are, but obviously when they take the survey without that prompt, then they get something like 40%, whereas the experts always get in the 90s. So it's kind of interesting. Another bit of information that's interesting as well about this survey is the predictive power that it has. So if I asked you to guess um, if you have uh, which results would give you the best predictive power to try to... Uh, to, to predict which students are more at risk, are the ones that are going to perform the best in their third and fourth year, uh, would it be the class survey result or would it be their exam performance? I mean, intuitively, you'd think it's the exam performance. That is a much, much better predictor of how well they're going to do in their third and fourth year as compared to their exam performances. So that's interesting. Now, we give that survey twice during the semester. We give it at the beginning and at the end. And what you hope for, obviously, is that your students are going to think a bit more like expert by the time the semester is over. But what we find almost universally, at least in biology, uh, physics, and chemistry, is that uh, there's always a negative shift. You see here, there's a bunch of data, like negative 4%, negative 10%. So students think more like novices after our courses. So that's a significant issue that we need to address. And I remember initially when I learned about this, it surprised me, it threw me for a loop, right? What's, what's happening? But when you interview students, it actually makes more sense. Uh, students will report things like, uh, oh, uh, you know, I, before the semester started, uh, you know, I, I imagined that physics would allow me to, uh, you know, to appreciate, you know, a lot of phenomena around me and everything. Now they go through the semester and they feel like all they're doing is pushing around symbols and equations. So they no longer feel that way.
So their thinking about the discipline becomes more novice-like. Uh, so what we found in the transformation is that you know, there was a significant positive shift. And the only way to get that is if you address it directly. Um, the third and last uh, example that we have for you of uh, summative assessment is, uh, are the midterm exams that now we call two-stage exams. So those are kind of neat because uh, we tacked on a formative assessment portion to them. Let me explain with the, the logistics here. So the first 90 minutes for those midterms is business as usual. Students come in, they do their individual midterm exams, and after 90 minutes, they just submit it. Okay? But after that, uh, students get in groups of three or four students, and they redo the same exam. Okay? So they spend about a half hour to do this, half hour, 45 minutes. And you only give one exam copy per group. So they have to come to consensus. That's very important. And of course, the engagement is like nothing you've ever seen before. It's very, very intense. The students argue. They explain to one another. So, and you provide them uh, enough incentive for them to really give each other quality feedback by giving them something like 20% of their midterm score is the group score. But of course, if students uh, score higher on the individual portion, then they don't get penalized. So that's the logistics. Uh, the benefits are obvious. Students are getting feedback on the exam they just took immediately when they needed the most. And the feedback is most effective because what you find students doing is that they have to explain you know, to others what their thinking is, why they think the answer should be this or that, and they're exposed to other people's point of view. That's, we all know that's a, an important aspect of learning. And um, what's interesting, students really enjoy it. So the first time I did this was in 2009. And now this has been given to, at least at the institution I was at, in now as of this semester, 80, 89 courses. So, and everywhere it's the same. It's very robust. It never fails. Students love it, and the instructors even love it more. 